Wow. Whoa. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Hello. This is not the Lord speaking. It's the Lord speaking. <laughs> um, okay. It sounds pretty loud up here to me, but uh, but I hope it's, hope it's a good balance for you. Uh, we've been looking at the life of David as a window into spiritual realities this week. And we see David, the, the shepherd boy who became king. It's, it's the great story uh, of, a, of a boy who listens to the voice of God and follows God as his king and becomes king, leading Israel into the golden age. The golden age of Israel. And God promised David several times. We, this is recorded in the scripture, but he gives him this promise that if, if your descendants take heed to walk faithfully, they walk faithfully before me with, with their heart and with their soul, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. God promises David. What a promise. You know that if, you're, if your sons follow after me, this throne will never fail. But what happens? Even before David turns the throne over to his son, failure. David, the friend of God, the mighty warrior king, the scepter is not even passed out of his hand before he breaks the covenant with, with God. He breaks and fails of God's requirement. And tonight, through the life of David, we want to look into the reality of sin and strongholds in the human life. And the only cure possible. A good definition of sin before we begin, we want to define our terms. But sin, a very working definition of sin is any turn away from the person and law of God. Any deviation from the will and word of God. A stronghold. Well, what, what's a stronghold? A stronghold is where sin takes root in the soul of a human and begins exercising specific control over a human life. Okay? But, but how, does, how does sin take root in a person's life? And how does it begin controlling thoughts and actions? Uh, the text Micah read for us yesterday, uh, Romans 8, 6, the mind controlled by the sinful flesh is what? The mind controlled by the sinful flesh is death, right? Well, how, how does this death take hold of a person's life long before they physically die? They begin manifesting death through sinful, obsessive actions and thoughts. Uh, many people like to think that sin that sin can't take control unless they personally uh, encounter, you know, entities of darkness, unless they unless they personally take take part in, in some ceremony or ritual of darkness. And if you've been paying attention, you, you know these things are out there, right? Uh, as a former NASA engineer encountered uh, by the name of Bill Vail several years ago, he, he went through a life crisis where he got divorced, several other life changes. He decided to move to Arlington, Texas and take a job working for a water filtration company where there was most, you know, very little stress. He could just knock that job out. And, and work his, his full week, take some overtime, and get paid well. He already had a lot of money from being a NASA engineer. And he thought he would take time to heal in Arlington, Texas. Uh, but, but one day, he, he received a strange call to go out. Well, it wasn't too strange to go out on a Saturday, but it was good money. So he thought he would take the call. But this call was strange. 
in that he was asked to be at this, at this house, a specific house, at a certain period of time. He had to be there on the minute. He had to knock on the door on the minute. And I can't remember what hour it was, but let's just say like 1 o'clock. He had to knock on the door at 1 o'clock. And he was walking onto, this, onto the porch of this house at about a minute. He was parked outside and walked up about a minute before his appointed time. And he went to knock on the door, and the door was partly open, and then he could hear some screaming in the house. And he thought, oh no, you know, somebody's in trouble. You know, he wasn't putting two and two together. But so anyway, so he kind of pushes and knocks the door open, and he walks into the, into the room, and he sees into the next room a very strange sight where a woman is standing over three men who are on their knees, and she is screaming incantations at these men. And then as soon as he walks in the door, she points her finger at him and says, Into him! He's like, oh, man, he's not familiar with God. He's not familiar with darkness, and he just doesn't know what's going on. He knows it's weird. First he thought someone was being hurt, and then he sees this ceremony, and then he, he tries to get out and turns to the, gets out the door, but not before. He hears this woman say, come out of him into him. Well, he's a rationalist. He's a, he's a NASA engineer, and he goes home, and you know, he's not thinking much of it. He goes home, uh, begins getting home for the night, like, flies on the bed, and, and then out of the corner of his eye, he sees something. He's like, what, what was that? Some shadow figure out of the corner of his eye. He thought he was seeing something, and soon he saw another shadow figure out of the corner of his eye again. He then, well, I've, just, I've been exhausted. I'll just try to get some sleep. And so he shuts the bedroom door, and he, he tries to sleep, and something runs over the foot of the bed. Well, he tries to use his rational mind and, and think it's a rat that somehow got in the house. Long story short, this man who did not know Jesus Christ or was not protected by the grace of God began to experience manifestations among the spirits uh, in his life. And many people think that this is how strongholds take effect, where we encounter some ritual of darkness. But what if I told you the truth was far more simple and far more insidious than that of how darkness takes strongholds in a human life. The first warning of the power of sin is actually given by God in Genesis chapter 4, where God warns Cain. Cain is angry at God because, because God has accepted Abel's sacrifice and not his. And, and Cain is, is kind of angry, thinking God is not just. He's angry at his brother. He's angry at God. And, and God, God in his loving grace warns Cain. Genesis 4, 7. Then the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right... Will you not be accepted? But if you not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door and desires to have you possess you. But you must rule over it. God describes sin here, purely spirit terms. We would liken it to a demon entity crouching at the door, ready to devour the human soul. And how will this sin be invited in? Through some strange ritual? Oh no. Just Cain embracing Cain, embracing his own rights. He will enter the devouring nature of sin. And what happens? Does Cain listen to God? No, Cain embraces his own rights. And in order to justify himself and express his own rights, he kills his brother, who was offering legitimate sacrifices and worship to God. Sin, stronghold, comes through the embrace of a self-identity apart from God. David, 
Great King David, same thing. This great man of God begins to turn toward himself and sin. This entity of, of the spiritual reality of sin begins to take hold of King David. He's at the pinnacle of success. And he thinks, wow, we have conquered our enemies. We have power. We have success. And he doesn't go out to battle anymore. He just stays back at the palace and enjoys being king. And 2 Samuel 11, 3 records for us that one evening, at the pinnacle of his success, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. So here's, here's David from his vantage point on the palace roof in the early evening. And from his vantage point, he can look down into the city and into certain houses. And he sees this gorgeous woman. And he thinks, well, uh, that's pretty nice. Bathsheba. He finds out her name later, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, is one of his warriors. Bathsheba is taking a bath. The irony, right? David sees, and he lusts, and he desires. Now, Micah said yesterday that the battle of sin is fought first in the mind. Right? What's David been doing with his mind? Well, let's look at this. The Bible tells us lust had begun to take control of David. How do we know this? Because God had given David a wife. But was that wife enough for David? No, he, he took another wife, and then another. And at this point, we know for sure that David had at least six wives. And surely that's enough for one man, right? I mean, those of you who are married, uh, how, how would you, you know, how would you like to have six wives? Uh, okay, so, uh, so <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not going to pay you back with what you were doing the other day. But anyway, uh, but uh, rabbinic sources tell us that, well, the Bible tells us that he began to take concubines. Well, what's a concubine? Well, it's someone who's not a wife that you put in a harem that you, you use sexually. So in addition to his six wives, now he takes... More concubines and rabbinic sources tell us it was at least 18. Likely more than that. By the time David walks on the palace roof and desires Bathsheba, he's been defeated by lust for years. That's why when he looks, he simply inquires who she is. He doesn't care that she's married. Bring her to me. And he took her right there. Because he'd already lost the battle of his mind, he thought that's whatever woman he wanted to get at. Bubbly and scrubbly Bathsheba. So beautiful. But he cares not about the fact that she belongs to another man. And it begins a whole declension of sin, lying, deceit, and murder. He not only has to murder Uriah, the husband, to cover up his sin. Now he murders Uriah, Uriah's own whole troop. And then the civil war that begins to split Israel apart and all the, the thousands upon thousands of men who perished in that. God says to David, at that point in time, God says to David, what you did in secret, taking a man's wife, will be done to you in public. One from your own house will take your wives in the sight of Israel. Regicide, his own son, strives for the kingdom. Strives to kill his own father, patricide. Absalom, we read in 2 Samuel 16.22, takes the palace and pitches a tent on the roof. And inside of all Israel, from that tent, he takes one by one David's concubines. In the sight of all Israel. What are we talking about here? 
Generational sin. Stronghold of sin that came down from this man of God who won so many battles in his life for God and called a friend of God. But what did he do? He opened the door to that crouching entity of sin and let it in. Excused lust of David by taking his 18 wives and concubines. What happened to that became swollen lust of his son Solomon. So how many did Solomon need for one desire? A thousand. So back to this question. How will sin create strongholds in your life? How will sin create strongholds in you? Well, I'll tell you, just give in to the person that you see right here. Can you see yourself? All right. Now can you see yourself? Before you leave here tonight, walk by this mirror. If you want to know how strongholds will take effect in your life, it will take effect by you giving in to the person you see in the mirror. Some of you are having a hard time believing this, right? I'm so cute. How could all this bring a stronghold? <laughs> and the world says, our world says, believe in yourself. You're so wonderful. Express your little self. <laughs> That's a stronghold. You boys, when that girl walks by and gets that little flip of the hair and says, hey. <laughs> and you're like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> she, she can't, she can't be falling. No, no. And you girls, when that guy walks by and gives that little smirk and pops the pecs and gives a flex, he's so cute. He can't be fallen. Right? Our world has conditioned you from very early on. And, I, and I'm ashamed to say that some of your parents didn't know any better than telling you they different. But the world's been telling you from very early on, conditioning and, and propagandizing your mind to build strongholds from day one and call it from God. God made me this way. Oh no. Oh no. Stronghold. You may just be seeing a stronghold when you see that pretty face, that cute guy. You may just be seeing a stronghold focused on you in the moment. But when you stop feeding that stronghold, Kick the curve. Four aspects of sin. When we look into this great cry of Psalm 51, four aspects of sin. Number one, sin is a spiritual reality. When Adam fell away and, and, and humanity descended into a condition of original sin, this became our birthright. We were born into this. We can't say God created us this way because we were fallen. Long before we ever got here, we were fallen in our, in our first parent, Adam. Uh, Romans 5, 12, sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all humans because all have sinned. We all deal with the spiritual reality that we didn't ask for. You didn't ask for this junk. You didn't ask to come into a fallen world, but that's what we got. So we have to accept some cure for this that doesn't come from ourselves. <clears throat> As humans, our spirits are dead in sin apart from the grace of God, and by nature, we turn from the person, presence, law, and word of God. What is that called? If we turn from the person, presence, law, word of God, what's that called? It's sin. And darkness comes in as an angel of light. Appealing to our desires outside the will of God. Build a little cute package over what you feel inside as your personal truth. Never telling you, just like never told Adam and Eve, never told Cain, never told David. You embrace
face that, you're going to die. One saint has told me, class, I had the privilege of teaching a world religions class in my hometown, college there. And she came to me after class and she said, you're the first person who realized what Satanism is. I said, oh. She said, yeah, you, uh, you know that we really don't necessarily worship Satan as an entity. We worship Satan as an ideal that helps us worship ourselves. Yes, I understand that very well. She was my friend from that point on, for whatever reason. But this reality, sin is a spiritual reality. Second, sin masks as pleasure and reward. Sin will mask as this person in the mirror. Sin will mask as something of your personal rights, your self-identity apart from God. A replacement morality. Everybody has a morality and everybody has a code. The only question is, is it, God, is it God's code? Or is it one that you made up to fit your natural desires? Sin mask like that. Mask is something, replacement good, even replacement Christ. Our world is filled with the spirit of Antichrist. Offering you replacement with Christ every day. Universal healing. Cosmic Christ. Not Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Sin, third, sin creates human strongholds. Masking as a good, it creates ground in the soul. It, wreck, it, it, it wrecks our inner person and calls it good. And just briefly, how do you recognize strong? How do you recognize when a stronghold is at work in your life? Well, here's a, here's a couple ways to, to look. Obsessive behavior, compulsive behavior, addictions, where getting to where you don't even make a mental decision, your flesh makes it for you. You've got a stronghold at work. Okay? Third, a fourth, sin brings generational burdens. Now, I had more to go into here, but because of time, just very briefly, Exodus 25 tells us that, that the sin of the fathers and the, and the grandfathers is visited upon children and, and grandchildren. Uh, so in, order, in addition to this original sin that we get from Adam, we have, a, we have to deal with a burden, a weight, sometimes that comes down from, from our, our parents and grandparents that we didn't ask for. Now this sin is very specific, and it, it has a tendency for certain things. Now the Bible tells us also in Ezekiel 18, that children do not bear guilt for this sin. Okay? But they also have to recognize that they live under its effect. And it's generated as a generational burden. Okay? God is just, and even though even though many children have to deal with the stuff that's, that's come from their parents, they don't, they're not gonna, they're not gonna die eternally for that. Okay? So how do we deal with, with the sin reality that we didn't ask for and didn't want? And here in Psalm 51, here's David. He's dealing with the weight of his own tragedy, of his sin, where he's faced by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God and by the prophet. He's faced with his own sin, and he begins to cry out to God. Here we have this, this cry for mercy. That's the first component for dealing with these strongholds of sin, a cry for mercy. Uh, verses 1 and 2, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He's appealing now to the covenant love of God. He's saying, have mercy according to what? According to your loving kindness. Literally, your covenant love. Your love based on your own person that was given to me. Oh Lord, because of who you are, have mercy and wash me. Cleanse me. He's recognizing this, this component, facing this cry in grace alone. Like Israel, when, when they were in the wilderness, much later, in, in the wilderness, Jesus gives this in, in John chapter 3, where, where he he says that this condition of Israel in the wilderness is, is, a, is a metaphor of our condition. When they were bit by these venomous vipers that went throughout the camp, 
because of their disobedience. And the vipers one by one begin to fight. So here they are dying. And in the side of all camp, he, he, God tells Moses to lift up this representation of the sin curse, which Jesus takes to himself in the sight of all the people. And everyone who looked in faith lived. Everyone who turned inward to themselves died. Jesus, the son of David, is this, this is what I give. I am in the sight of the world. I am taking the curse. Look to me and live. And cry for mercy. A full confession, verses 3 and 4, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. You are found just when you judge, blameless when you speak. Now here's a very curious verse. David has done all this, this horrible stuff. But he says to God, against you and you alone have I sinned. Has David sinned against people? Yes, innumerable people. But his confession recognizes this, that in, that in his sin against people, he has participated in cosmic rebellion against God. He's participated in that ancient rebellion of the, where the ancient serpent was cast down. He recognizes that. Full confession. That in me is a sin principle that would overthrow God if it could. In me, in that pretty little, all this. In there is a sin principle that would overthrow God if it could. Look in the room of your heart by, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And tell me who is sitting on the throne of your heart. David recognizes that he's been sitting on the throne in rebellion against God. So he's asking, asking for this cleansing, recognizing and acknowledging. And he brings him to a decisive repentance in verses 5 and 6. Behold, he says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Here, here he turns from that idolatry of his natural self, all the self-deception of his inward parts, and he says, God, I need truth right here. He's asking God to replace that inward false with the inward true. And he recognizes that he was sinful from birth. He's conceived in sin. He recognizes that sin principle and sin condition. And repents not just for his actions of sin, but for the principle of sin that brought the actions. And then a, a, a restoration in worship and the means of grace. In verses 7 and 8, purge me with this, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones you've broken may rejoice. What's this purging with this? Well, God had pre prescribed, prescribed the, the, the Levitical ritual of cleansing with Hyssop where the, where the blood and the water would be sprinkled in terms of cleansing in the grace of God. It was a means of grace. It was a form of worship looking forward to a divine work that would come where there was one who would come, the Bible tells us, by the water and the blood. 1 John 5, 1 and 6, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood, and the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. It's a great mysterious 
work of God revealed in, in Christ, that, that here the one who is given for us for cleansing from all this burden of sin is given by water and blood, by birth and life, water and by atoning death, blood. We who are renewed in joy and gladness find that, that this healing springs forth in this divine intercession that comes through Jesus Christ by water and blood. And I will tell you this, we'll mention this water and blood in the closing of the sermon and apply it hopefully to our lives, but no one who is serious about cleansing from original and generational sin and strongholds, nobody who's serious about getting rid of that will avoid God's means of grace. Don't pretend that you care about that cleansing if you ignore the provision of grace that he's prescribed in worship, in word, in prayer, in fellowship, in sacrament, in forgiveness. Then next, the renewal of praise and gratitude and true humility. Verses 15 to 17. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall so show forth your praise. Open my lips, God, and these lips will praise you, and my life will praise you. He recognizes here of this, 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 this praise as a weapon against darkness. Um, the Psalms give, the, give this image of, of praise as, as, as the high praises of God in the mouth connected with the sword in the hand. And a beautiful passage in 2 Chronicles 20 where Jehoshaphat, king of Israel, actually put the singers and the worshipers ahead of the troops and tells them to march on and sing the praises of God. Oh, oh, the beauties of God's holiness before the troops. The Bible tells us that as they sang, the Holy Spirit came and won a great victory for the troops of Israel. Praise God. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. Praise, not sacrifice. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. One Puritan pastor put it this way. If you want to defeat Satan, do you want to defeat Satan? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. And then when you look at others, consider everyone you meet as better than you are, no matter their station in life or apparent despair and sin. So you're looking first at Jesus, and when you look at others, they're above them. You recognize that. Jesus said, uh, years after this, he said, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then finally, restore communion with God for the kingdom. Verses 10 to 13 Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Union with God in Christ. Communion with the Spirit of God and the people of God. This is the whole goal of Christian life. The whole goal of Christian life is not to belong to a church. Not to go through some religious ritual. The goal is union with God in Christ. Full restoration. Communion with God for you, and 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 me. Praise God. This brings us full circle. David, the great king, failed of the covenant of God. But did God let that promise go? No. We know that there was a long period of time where because of David's sin and his, his generational tumbling, the throne was vacated. The physical throne was vacated. But God took it upon himself to fulfill the promise because one greater than David came to sit on David's throne into eternity. And he is sitting on that throne tonight. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. 
on those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the seal of the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty, will accomplish this. Praise God. David failed. David failed to establish the kingdom. But one of David's line, greater than David, the great I am, has kept the covenant for us. Praise God. And the beauty of God's grace. I don't know how God does this. But not only does this one, this Messiah Jesus come to fulfill the covenant and sit on David's throne. But in that coming, he redeems David's failure. For he chooses as his great, great plus grandmother the very woman that David took. The wife, as in the lineage of Matthew 1 6, called him the wife of Uriah. God used her. I don't know how God does this. God took the very sin that shattered David's life and line and used it to establish the line of Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our God. C.S. Lewis says this, that, that the salvation of God comes, redemption of God comes into your life, not just for the present, and not just for the future, but in accepting this redemption now, in the power of Christ, by the Holy Spirit, that redemption of heaven reaches back into the past, to the worst sin that you ever committed. And in the future, God will take that sin and write it into this story for good and for the covenant. Same promise that, he spoke, that, that Joseph spoke by the Holy Spirit to his brothers in Genesis 15 20. You meant for evil. You meant for evil to sell me into slavery. You meant for, for evil to possibly kill me. God, God meant it for good for the saving of many souls alive. That's what God does to your sin, mine, by grace through Christ. He puts his name over it. He rules and overrules in our sin and puts his name over our life at the very end. He calls it his own and he calls it good. That's redemption. This is what comes to those who believe God. God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. 1 John 5, 1, the water of the blood again. Whoever believes and trusts themselves fully that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves who has been born of him. And this is he who came by the water and the blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. The Spirit testifies to this truth. The Spirit is testifying tonight. The water and the blood. By the water, His real birth. This one was really incarnated. God was incarnate. The Word became flesh. He lived a sinless life for you. And that act of righteousness through the birth of the water that He lived perfectly is placed to your account. The blood, that atoning death, what makes us right with the Holy God? Nothing but the blood. This, this being made right before God and this great transfer of His righteousness for ours. This is our only hope. And this is David's Son giving you the entrance to the kingdom by the water and the blood. Purge me, Lord. I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. This cry of David is your cry too. It's David's hope and ours. The grace of the one 
who has come, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah God. Hallelujah. Amen. Bye-bye.